many pilots who may have been contemptuous of uh, wing contamination uh, now realize that uh, there is uh, inherent danger in taking off uh, with even small amounts of contamination because the effect upon lift is uh, unpredictable and uh, therefore the only safe attitude is to uh, adopt a policy of not taking off without de-icing if there's any suspicion whatsoever that the wings may be contaminated, however slightly. Clouding of judgment, I guess, is what bothers me because we all know what we should be doing and for some reason or other, when you get all these factors operating and you're under stress and you're under pressure, maybe you don't make the good decisions that you should. If you can't see the surfaces or you're not sure whether the, the wing is warm or not or, or whether the uh, contaminants are hearing or not, you're in doubt, de-ice. As a crew member, I think a uh, captain sets the tone if they say, um, if you don't see anything or if you see something you don't like, speak up. A group of concerned professionals, airline pilots, flight attendants, private pilots, ground crew and helicopter pilots have gathered together in a hangar to talk about ice contamination, its dangers, and how to deal with it. The first item on the agenda is the Dryden crash and its implications. On March 10, 1989, on a snowy afternoon, Air Ontario Flight 1363 took off and crashed moments later into a densely wooded area less than one kilometer west of Dryden's airport. The only surviving crew member was Sonia Hartwick. And you can smell soot and you can smell um people starting to burn, like the smell of hair burning. 24 people lost their lives that day, and 45 survived. I'm here um, on behalf of these people. I have, I think they have the right to know families of the deceased, the survivors, my co-workers, and the flying public, the events of the week that led up to this tragic event on March 10th in hopes to prevent a disaster like this ha happening in the future. This tragedy triggered one of the most exhaustive investigations ever conducted into an aircraft accident. The three-year Dryden Commission, headed by the Honorable Virgil Mashansky, determined that a buildup of ice on the Fokker F-28's wings was only one of the factors that contributed to this disaster. Other factors were inadequate ground procedures, crew stress, corporate pressures, and poor communications between the cabin crew and the flight deck. If someone had spoken up, this catastrophe might have been avoided. On the previous type of aircraft, the Convair 580, it was not uncommon for them to fly with considerable amounts of uh, contamination on the wing surfaces. Um, Captain Morwood had come off that aircraft. The chief pilot on the F-28 had come off that aircraft. It was pretty well known throughout the company that this was sort of an accepted thing within the company. Um, um, as a result, going on a new aircraft, perhaps uh, the training not enforcing the fact that the critical wing on the F-28 uh, was super critical with any kind of contamination, the fact that they had probably done it and gotten away with it numerous times on the Convair over the previous years, uh, that kind of positive reinforcement perhaps led him to believe that he wasn't in as critical a situation as he was. It, you can't measure and you can't put yourself in that guy's mind as to what he was thinking at the time. It ended up it was a bad decision. And you keep asking yourself why, and then you make assumptions knowing a little bit about human factors. Well, that put pressure on him, that put pressure on, that put pressure on. 
And so it ends up, you know, as a, as a pilot error, and I, I would call it maybe pilot saturation. The pressure was put on them, as Judge Mishansky mentioned, from all kinds of angles. It, it really is it expecting too much from the pilot to put, to put them under all those conditions at one time. Although the responsibility ultimately ends up on the pilot's shoulders, it's unrealistic to, um, to pretend that we work in a vacuum and that factors such as um, unserviceable aircraft or uh, pressures from schedule or pressures from uh, um, the company to, to take off or to continue on, as well as unreasonable uh, flight duty days, long days, and uh, the fatigue factor aren't elements of, of the accident that contribute to the decision making of the pilot and uh, perhaps the deterioration of, of good decision making. Approximately 85% of all aircraft accidents can be attributed to human error. Many of these accidents could be prevented if cabin and flight crews simply communicated more. I think the, the relationship between uh, cabin crew and the pilots is changing. It seems that we, once we've got the, uh, the newer, younger pilots that are coming on board, they're more friendly. They come on board, they say, hi, I'm so-and-so. The typical old pilots come on board, and if you know who they are, they usually go into the cockpit, or they grunt as they come on board, and you don't have a clue who they are. Um, and that's typical. Uh, the, the, the bigger the aircraft, the older the pilots, the more grumpy they are. It, it, this, it tends to follow suit. The hierarchy on, that, on the aircraft for years has been a problem. There's always been the assumption that the crew up front knew what they were doing. They had the education, the experience in the background to do it properly. Um, they also have to have all of the information. They have to use every resource available to them. Unfortunately, because of the attitude and the hierarchy that's built up over the years, that isn't always uh, there. You say you're, you're in the cabin, there's a lot of snow on the wing. Uh, you're gonna go up there and tell them that you, you, you tend to become self-conscious. Now, 15 years flying, I don't care what they say. I go up there, tell them, so at least I get that off my chest. I tell them there's snow on the wing. But I think a new hire or, or a person that hasn't been flying for a very long time might actually feel quite self-conscious about going up into the cockpit because uh, they're afraid of them. I must admit I'm a little intimidated to go up there and, and say something. I'd probably just hold back and let another flight attendant do it or something like that. Or if a passenger said something, I'd say, oh, no, it's OK. It, you know, they know what they're doing. It's, it's not a big deal. If I, if I say to you that uh, if you had smoke in the uh, cabin, would you go up and tell a captain? And I think you would probably say, yeah, right away, I go tell him. Well, I think snow or ice on the wings or this kind of thing is in the same category. Remember, from the flight deck, we can't see the wings. Yeah. Well, it's funny, though, because I know when I've done a, a Tokyo flight where we're fully loaded, we've taken a delay because of cargo. We've got a, a duty day that's running out. It's running out. And uh, if, if we run a duty time, then we go back to the gate and we cancel the flight or whatever. And so we're, we're say they're late loading the cargo and we're on the aircraft and the pilots are PO'd because they've been sitting up in the cockpit for an hour and, and it's snowing. And then we go and we get de-iced and then we get in the lineup and then we're sitting in the lineup. And you know that the wings are touching the ground with fuel. And you get to the end of the runway and uh, say you're, you're sitting over wing and you see all the snow. I mean, you're gonna pick up the phone and go, uh, I think there's a little too much snow on this, you know. I think I would, because I don't want to end up on the 401. But I think as a result of Dryden, and uh, Dale can maybe speak to, you know, sort of cr uh, crew cockpit resource management training. It's not cockpit resource management training, it's crew. And, uh, and it should be bringing everybody and creating that consultative atmosphere when you're making decisions. And the atmosphere that encourages people just by saying hello in the crew bus and introducing yeah. yourself automatically opens that door. One, one way it was described um, during the crew resource management or cockpit resource management is when you get on the airplane, turn right instead of turning left. The automatic response for pilots is just to turn left, go up, close the door, and, and uh, just two seconds of saying hello and establishing some sort of a, a, a shell, a, a group that you're working together and your team, um, even if it's the third airplane you've been in on that day, it's a, a really important thing and perhaps lowers a barrier that was there. People feel that these are all humans, we're all working together, we're on a team.
the flight attendant side of the house is trained extensively in identification of hazards on board. Um, you know, what is smoke, where it's coming from, how to address, how to attack the fires and all that. They aren't given the basic training in what is icing and how, how does it affect the performance of the aircraft and without getting into advanced aerodynamics and performance characteristics of a type and all that. Basic fundamental education in what is what are the different type of contaminants that could adhere to a wing and how might they affect the aircraft would probably place you folks in a more comfortable position to go forward and say, hey, I studied that, I know that that is a problem, or I know that it's dry, you know, it's 40 below zero, the wings are cold, the snow is cold, and as soon as we start rolling through the taxiway, that's going to blow off. Without that basic knowledge, they're going to feel uncomfortable because they don't have a basis on which to go forward and say, I have a concern. Each year, there are numerous aircraft accidents directly linked to surface contamination. The consequences can be deadly. Light airplanes and helicopters are far more susceptible to the dangers of ice because they're not as well equipped to handle it. We are not ones to call for de-icing or not. We can certainly recommend or say, uh, did you happen to see this on the trailing edge of the wing? You know, we noticed this. But ultimately, it's the pilot in command that gets the call to de-ice. And it, uh, it, you know, certainly there's people that don't want you to spray much fluid on their aircraft. Uh, it's $8 a liter. Uh, and they're just praying and watching you and trying to put a kink in the hose while you're spraying it so it doesn't come out so fast. It's not cheap stuff. And I guess that's factored in some point. But it's, I don't think it's, uh, I don't, it doesn't happen that often. And, at an airport watching a chap with a pro small private aircraft and he had all kinds of ice and he'd, he'd snow and he'd, he'd taken the snow off but there was still a little bit of ice on and he says, you know, you shouldn't be flying with that. And the guy says, it's okay, it's only a short trip. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter how short it's going to be even shorter, you know. What you're worrying about is loss of performance on uh, the blade. You sh you'll notice uh, a requirement for more power to maintain the altitude and the airspeed that you're flying at. You're also worried about what they call asymmetrical shedding. If there is a buildup of ice on the blades and it's shed off one blade, then you can get an imbalance which could cause problems. The backdoor saving grace of a helicopter in the event of an engine failure is that the helicopter does what is called auto rotation, that is that the blades will rotate automatically as a result of the airflow through the blades. As the aircraft is descending, you can maintain operating RPM. You select the landing site and you land the aircraft very gently. Um, when ice builds up on the wings, in our case the main rotors, or tail rotors, you, but on the main rotors you lose the ability to maintain the type of ro the, the speed of rotation, in which case uh, the expression I think commonly referred to is we come down like a greased manhole cover. We fly an air ambulance out of CARP 24 hours a day. There's a lot of calls in the middle of the night that you're not, you've got to make the decision in the winter time. Sometimes the weather is just at the point where you might be able to get underneath it and, and go and get, make this patient transfer or maybe it's not so good. And um, then you're, you're feeling the pressures of uh, uh, the sick patient, also the pressures of uh, business, the company business. So it's, it's never, it's not always a real easy cut and dry decision. No matter what your training, no matter what your background, there's gonna be times it's, uh, it's not gonna be easy for sure. So the human factor is thing, having no one, having the information available. Why do you, as a person under pressure with all these things going on, choose to disregard it for whatever reason? Or why does it slip out of your priority list in making that decision? And I think this is where things like decision making, training at the early stages, recognizing that maybe your judgment is flawed because you're under certain pressures and maybe you better sit back, count 10 or 20, and start to reassess that situation. Those two pilots that were sitting in the back end of the aircraft in Dryden, I put myself, tried to put myself in their seats a number of times. Um, I would certainly not hesitate to, to go up front now. Prior to the Dryden crash, I'm not so sure. You just assumed that there was a professionalism, um, that there was a, a level of knowledge there that you shouldn't have to intervene in another man's area of responsibility. And I think that, if anything, Dryden 
sort of disprove that. And uh, there's a changed attitude out there, not only for the flight attendants, but for the passengers as well. I have had passengers specifically ask the flight attendants to come up front and say, hey, there's still snow out there. We realized that we hadn't de-iced yet, but there is a greater awareness as a result of this particular accident, I think, than there ever was before.